I was the person, and I don't feel good about this, uh, that uh, used the three words, shut it down. There's a place where the sun comes up, bright with the promise of day. Coming on high, making love with the sky, it's only a daydream. We are very sorry to advise you that Pan American Airways has suspended operations. All flights are canceled. The recorded message on Pan Am's reservations line said it all. The airline, losing $2 million a day, calls it quits. Thousands of passengers are stranded, many airlines refusing to honor their special fare tickets. Over 9,000 employees lose their jobs. <laughs> On December 4th, 1991, Pan American World Airways ceased operations. Once the world's leading airline with scores of pioneering achievements to its credit, Pan Am slipped into history virtually unnoticed. The airline that literally taught the world to fly was wrought with financial difficulties caused by deregulation, mismanagement, terrorism, and restrictive U.S. government policies. Once Pan Am's assets are divided among the creditors by the bankruptcy court, Perhaps one of the few remnants of the air carrier may be this sign in Key West, Florida, reminding us of the airline's humble beginnings. The sign is displayed outside a building which was once Pan Am's ticket office. The restaurant that was housed here has also shut down. One of the thousands of unemployed Pan Am veterans is Captain Richard DeVille. Captain DeVille is one of the few volunteers working at the Pilots Association in Miami, helping colleagues secure their personnel files necessary for applying for other jobs. I'm in a period of assessment, I guess, would be a good thing to say, trying to decide what my decision, where am I going to fly, how am I going to pay the bills or feed the family, or what, how am I just going to continue my life? And yes. at my age, 53, it's difficult for me to start at entry level at another airline, although I would be quite happy to do so, and do so cheerfully. But I'm sure the situation will change drastically if, if we don't find employment, you know, by the end of our un unemployment compensation. How long is that? 26 weeks. Mm -hmm. It's kind of unfair. But some people who took leaves of absences in order to save jobs don't get the full 26 weeks. Theirs were cut because they didn't work a full year. That, that happened part time. Right. That happened to a friend of mine, so her income is um, lower than mine from unemployment and shorter because she took leaves in order to save someone else's position. Even even if you didn't see a person for a year, you'd see them or you'd fly with them a year later and it's like you guys had never parted. You knew they were always gonna be there though. And then once it's all taken away from you, whether you saw this person every month or you saw them once a year, they're gone. You're never going to see them again. And yeah, it is like a family being taken apart from flight attendants to cockpit crews to gate agents, even the baggage handlers, you know? For years, the former Pan Am employees felt they belonged to an extended family, and they took joy in being part of it. With the stroke of a pen, it was all gone. And it couldn't have happened at a worse time than the approaching festive holiday. Faced with an uncertain future, and clinging to their past memories, the former employees gathered at Dinner Key a week after the shutdown of Pan Am to pay their last homage to an airline that set the standards of aviation for the rest of the industry to follow. With Pan Am gone, they could only hold on to each other and share their pain and anguish. This farewell gathering of former Pan Am employees marked the end of an era and definitely 
the end of an American institution that started 64 years ago. October 28, 1927, 500 years after Leonardo da Vinci came up with the idea of the flying machine, a Fokker F-7 plane took off from Key West, Florida to Havana, Cuba. This was an historic moment. America's first scheduled international flight was on its way. This little-known airline was called Pan American Airways. Hugh Wells was the pilot, with Edward C. Music, his co-pilot. The first flight carried 14 bags of mail, weighing 722 pounds on behalf of the U.S. Postal Service. Flying at 85 miles an hour, the plane arrived in Havana one hour and 20 minutes later. This was the start of a new era. While no one took flying seriously in the early 1920s, Juan Tripp, a visionary entrepreneur born June 27, 1899 in New York, had a dream that the airplane could be used to ferry people and goods to far-off places. He convinced his friends to put up some money when he found out seven war surplus planes were up for auction. He bought the planes at $500 apiece and started Long Island Airways. Juan Tripp's first airline took people for joy rides only. As soon as he realized that the future of the airline business needed a company with substantial financial backing, Tripp approached his friends with deep pockets once again and raised $300,000. He invested the money into a newly formed corporation called Pan American Airways, Inc., started by an Army Air Corps intelligence officer, Major Henry H. Arnold, along with three other officers. Pan American came into existence after Major Arnold, later known as General Henry Hap Arnold, had received intelligence reports that the Germans were installing an airline in Colombia called SCOTA. Arnold reasoned, if Pan American could run U.S. Postal Service mail hops from Key West to Havana and beyond, America could keep the Germans in check. When Major Hap Arnold couldn't leave the Army and his fellow officers failed to raise the necessary cash, Tripp stepped in and was elected as the president and general manager of the new airline. He was, he was an amazing genius who understood all facets of, of the development of aviation. Both, uh, many people have the ability to do it te technologically, but don't understand the commercial need. But Juan Tripp had the concept all-around concept of being able to develop an airplane and the need for it and the ability to, to uh, pay for it and make it viable commercially. He was an extraordinary man. Juan Tripp enlisted the services of celebrated aviator Charles Lindbergh, who initially conducted the survey routes and became the company's pathfinder. Soon, Charles Lindbergh was joined by Ed Music and the two of them cruised the Caribbean on a Sikorsky duck plane, scouting skyway after skyway. Their mapping of the air routes for travel and traveling became the basis for all other aviators and their respective airlines. Another man hired by trip was a Dutchman named Andre Priester. Priester, as a chief engineer, introduced the notion that flying had to be done with utmost care. He fired his pilots for smoking in public. And since earlier planes were flying boats, he established naval uniforms for the pilots as one of the measures for orderly and disciplined behavior. Even today, pilots all around the world support naval uniforms. Where we're standing right now, this building in the background was built by Pan American. It was completed in 1934 and was our Miami Marine Air Terminal. And it was from here that uh, we did so much long-range uh, uh, scheduled flying. Behind me, you can see the, the logos that are still, those are the original logos put there by Pan Am, just as there are around the top of the balcony of the building here. And it was very close to the original logo on the Pan Am uh, aircraft. Well, this is a very sentimental place to many of us because from here we branched out and made it all the way around the world. But it all started here. Dinner Key, which got its name from the early settlers of Coconut Grove, who used the island for picnic dinners, 
was once the most busy marine terminal in the world. In the official 1938 Pan American Handbook, the airport is described as a sightseer's paradise. In the 30s, Dinner Key was attracting 25,000 visitors a month and up to 100,000 during the winter tourist season. One of the attractions for visitors at Dinner Key was this 10-foot globe. Art Smith, a former Pan Am employee, found the globe rotting away in a paper shack at Miami International Airport in 1961. He retrieved the historical artifact and restored it to its original glory. The globe is now housed at the Planetarium in Miami. Art just told me something very interesting about this globe when it was put in in, in 1933. And what was that, Art? Oh. I was doing photography for the air, airline, and uh, we got a crazy idea. We perched a couple of models up on the top of the ring. Models? Models. Pretty girl models. Oh. <laughs> and uh, lots of legs. And they were sit at, sitting up there back to back. And I think it made every newspaper in the world. And a lot for your photography sure. career. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. But the, uh, the globe brings back memories. One of, one of Miami's pastimes, Saturdays and Sundays particularly, We'll be down, be, be down at the Pan Am Terminal about uh, 4, 30, 4 o'clock, 4.30, 5 o'clock when these airplanes all came in from Central and South America because uh, this gave rise to a lot of thoughts, I guess, about faraway places and, you know, the, the mystery of travel. The world isn't as big now as it was then, so uh, I don't know how many people will go to Miami International Airport and watch 747. I see a few of them out there once in a while. But they're, they're diehards like myself. You know, <laughs> it, um, Pan Am in those years, though, was developing airline techniques which have been adopted all over the world. They, uh, uh, many, of the, many of the techniques, many, many of the things that you take for granted now were done first by Pan Am. The early history of Pan Am is full of blazing trails. It was hardly a month passed by that the airline didn't rack up some new invention on the scoreboard. Pan Am revolutionized radio navigation on land and water, pioneered the principle for being able to tell their pilots their exact position at all times, the basis for modern aviation. First to develop a complete aviation weather service and long-range weather forecast. First to develop four-engine flying boats. Developed new engine and propeller brakes and carrying life-saving equipment. Started a flight medical research program first American airline to develop airport and airways traffic control systems. And among the many first Pan Am boasts is the first airline to complete an around-the-world flight. Another feature that marked Pan Am as the leading airline was Juan Tripp and his senior engineer's skill in getting the aircraft manufacturers to design and deliver planes according to their specifications, from single-engine to four-engine flying boats from DC-3s to Boeing 747s. The Martin M-130 flying boat was one such plane designed specifically for Pan Am. One of these planes was christened the China Clipper. The China Clipper made history by being the first plane to cross the Pacific in 1935. China Clipper, you have your sailing orders. Cast off and depart. <laughs> the latest report on the China Clipper. After 18 hours at sea, the Pan American flying boat is at this moment landing safely in Pearl Harbor at Honolulu, right on schedule. Pan Am built airports in the small Pacific islands of Midway, Wake, and Guam thus making it possible for a flying boat to reach Manila. The 7,800-mile hop was completed by Captain Eddie Music in 59 hours and 48 minutes. At the outbreak of the war, Juan Tripp ordered all of Pan Am's employees to subordinate their services to the military command as the need may arise. 
That ranged from maintenance men to the captains flying the planes. Throughout the war, the airline carried soldiers, military hardware, food and supplies to remote parts of the world at the behest of the State Department. Yeah, historically, Pan Am has been very involved with the government over the years, uh, as far back as World War II when, uh, when Pan Am took President Roosevelt across the Atlantic. Uh, that was one of the first big missions, but uh, Pan Am ferried numerous aircraft across the Atlantic and uh, uh, was very involved in all the wartime activity. Uh, Pan Am had the most efficient communication system in the world at the time the war began. And the government immediately used the facilities of Pan Am for communication as they, uh, nobody else had the facilities really available at that time. And uh, uh, Pan Am also built a lot of airports during that period to aid in the transport of uh, material across the Atlantic. In recognition of his airline's contribution to the military success, Juan Tripp was presented the Medal for Merit the highest civilian award by Secretary of War Robert P. Patterson. In addition, Tripp was awarded the Harmon Trophy by President Truman, which carried the citation at a time and in a manner that could not have been equaled by any other Allied agency. In pursuit of speed, larger payloads, and comfort, Pan Am continued to order new planes, thus revolutionizing the air industry. In 1958, Pan Am became the first American airline to fly a jet and brought the rest of the U.S. air industry into the jet age. One plane Pan Am has been very much identified with in terms of its development is the Boeing 747. Considered the safest and most comfortable commercial plane ever built, the Boeing 747 ended up costing more than Pan Am had anticipated. As the first airline to receive these jets, Pan Am had to work out the bugs, thus benefiting the rest of the air industry, which watched Pan Am from the sidelines. Boeing 747 was an aircraft that Pan American was involved in. We had always maintained a resident engineer at Boeing uh, for the development of the 707, the first, jet in, the first jet airplane, and the Boeing 747. We had staffs out there working with the Boeing people <clears throat> for the development of the Boeing 747. If you remember, Pan Am took the first delivery on the 747s, and that was because it had committed its money and its people to the development of the airplane and had contributed considerably in the specifications and then the, and the various other uh, data that were important to go into the creation of the airplane. And Juan Tripp had the concept. I think he eventually took delivery of 35 Boeing 747s. As in the Second World War, Pan Am was very much involved in carrying out operations on behalf of the U.S. military during the Vietnam War. When it became apparent that Saigon was about to fall to the communists, one man organized a daring feat, the last flight out of Vietnam. Al Topping was Pan Am's station manager in Saigon who masterminded the mission. Before you take off, I must inspect the exit visa of every person on board. We're ready to take off. It's too late for that. This plane stays here. What's the problem here? I must check that everyone on board has a proper exit visa. Flight is most irregular. I think the captain is trying to hide something. I'll stand aside. You're right. Al Topping is trying to hide something. There are two, I guess, two historical moments for me in Pan Am. One is, is my assignment in Vietnam. And two is my assignment here in Miami as corporate communications manager involved in the biggest story in the history of the company, which was the end of Pan Am on December 4th. Uh, Vietnam, of course, is very special for me because um, it involved uh, uh, getting uh, Pan Am employees and their families out of Saigon 
When were you assigned to Saigon? In 72. And in 1975, when the country was falling to the communist troops, uh, thanks to a lot of effort by a lot of people, and especially our pilots and flight attendants who flew into Vietnam during those final days as volunteers, uh, literally into a fire zone, uh, we were able to successfully uh, evacuate our employees and their family. What was it that made you give the word that this is it? This was, well, it's time to get out. I had a very difficult time with that problem. Uh, it, it took a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of pacing the floor, a lot of looking at the calendar, a lot of listening to the radio, talking to people, trying to determine when would Saigon fall. And finally, one night, I realized that May 1st, which was May Day, a major communist uh, holiday, would be the day that Saigon would fall. And fortunately for, for me and everyone else, uh, that turned out to be true. And so we uh, left on April 24th, and on, May, on April 30th, it was over. Overseas, Pan Am was often viewed as the official U.S. airline, thus making it an attractive target to the terrorists. The bombing of Flight 103 in December 1988 delivered a fatal blow to the struggling air carrier. The straw that broke the camel's back was Lockerbie. American was a household word all over the world. It was, it was the American flag to many people, uh, many foreigners. If you hit Pan Am, you were hitting the United States. It wasn't Pan Am they were after. It was the United States they were after. The United States government they were after. The American people they were after. Between Lockerbie and the Gulf War, uh, people just stopped traveling across the Atlantic for quite some period of time. Uh, that hit Pan American uh, particularly badly because of the publicity uh, that was put out there uh, claiming that Pan American security was in some, some way inferior to the security provided to other carriers. Uh, that once again is uh, a part of our government policy. All those European carriers uh, are provided security by their governments. Uh, their their national government takes care of all their security. It doesn't cost the carrier anything. <clears throat> Under U.S. policy, uh, any U.S. carrier has to provide its own security. So it's a very expensive item for any carrier to provide that. The security issue is one. Uh, the bottom line is if a terrorist group is tar has targeted your airplane or your airline, for destruction, uh, it's going to happen. I mean, that's the bottom line. Uh, what has to be done is, is nations have to create a policy that will discourage this from happening, and uh, steps should be taken in that direction. Uh, I mean, everybody was just scared off from traveling to Europe. It did not just uh, affect Pan Am, it affected everybody. Uh, however, Pan Am with Pan Am, it was a little bit more dramatic uh, than it was with some of those other carriers.
uh, we seemed to suffer that impact to a greater degree uh, simply because it was our aircraft that was knocked out of the sky. What do you feel that Pan Am first started to run amok? Pan Am's problems were created by our own one, our own government, uh, and it was politics. It wasn't. It wasn't anybody set out to do it. It was just a, po a political aspect. Uh, after the war, the domestics had learned, had used Pan Am's knowledge and technological advances to learn to fly uh, abroad. So they wanted to fly to foreign pl foreign places too. And uh, Pan Am, up to that time, had been the only American carrier that flew abroad. Up until 1978, Pan Am was prohibited from operating within the United States. Uh, we had no domestic route authorities at all. And uh, in all those years after World War II, uh, the government gradually started giving more and more U.S. carriers authority to travel across the Atlantic and the Pacific. Uh, and these carriers had big domestic route systems within the United States. Uh, which Pan Am uh, lacked. Uh, so these other carriers could feed their international services that Pan Am could not, and this gradually became more and more intense uh, in the Pacific and in the Atlantic in both areas. So Pan Am was losing ground all the time to this competition. When the U.S. domestic airlines decided to fly abroad, they lobbied the Congress, which passed a law with two clauses. Clause A permitted the domestic airlines to fly internationally. Clause B permitted Pan Am to fly domestically. However, Clause A was energized, but Clause B was never activated, despite Pan Am's futile attempts. The other 17 U.S. carriers banded against Pan Am and convinced the Congress that once the airline was allowed to fly domestically, it would monopolize the air routes. Although the legislation existed, Pan Am never benefited from it. All this time, there were no compensating domestic runs given to Pan American. We tried and tried and tried and never got anything. Well, to give you an example of what can happen there, let's suppose you're a Frenchman, you're walking down the Champs Elysees and you go into a travel bureau, you want a flight to go to St. Louis. Okay, you can go on Pan American, you go on TWA. But if you go on Pan American, you have to get off in Kennedy transfer it to another airline to go the rest of the way to St. Louis. If you buy a TWA ticket, you stay on TWA all the way to St. Louis. Now, even a Frenchman knows that's <laughs> what to do in a case like that. In 1978, under President Carter, the Congress passed a law freeing the air routes from governmental regulation. Thus, any carrier could fly anywhere within the United States. I think uh, a, a major arrow in our side uh, it had to occur in 1978 with the passage of the uh, uh, Deregulation Act uh, here in the United States because what it did was overnight create a, uh, a system in the free marketplace, which by the way I think has been good for America in general, in some parts not good, but deregulation uh, punished uh, the have-not carriers, the, the carriers that had weak balance sheets, uh, and, and overnight uh, those uh, weak carriers had to catch up. In a desperate attempt to find a domestic feeder, Pan Am had set its eyes on National. National Airlines, headed by George Baker, was a very successful domestic midsize airline. It is well remembered for its flamboyant and sometimes controversial ad campaigns. During the 1970s, the airline ran ads like this that offended feminists, but helped brisk up business at the check-in counters. In 1978, National, plagued by long strikes, ended up in a federal court. Pan Am's then president, William Sewell, approached the beleaguered airline with a merger plan. On January 7, 1980, National merged with Pan Am. Not many of the employees of National were happy with this marriage. Pan Am uh, bought National, and I have had mixed emotions about, uh, about the uh, purchase. Some of the wounds that, that I felt with the purchase was, as anyone would feel, would be the, the loss of 
your heritage, where you started uh, with the company. Because uh, I had 15 years with uh, National Airlines, and I had a great deal of allegiance to it. I mean, National in its own right was a marvelous uh, medium-sized carrier with a great bunch of people uh, and, and, a, and a wonderful uh, reputation. Uh, but it, w it flew in the wrong direction <laughs> for, for, Pan for Pan Am's feed out of its, uh, out of its major uh, gateway. Uh, fundamentally, uh, National served three corners of the United States, uh, uh, California, uh, Florida, and, and New York. And, and not going transcon, as we know transcon traffic, United, Delta, uh, American TWA, it didn't fundamentally provide the kind of uh, saturated feed that one has to have in its uh, coastal gateways to make sense Trans-Pacific or Transatlantic. We had spent uh, something like a billion dollars to purchase National, and just as soon as we, we uh, effected that purchase, we borrowed money. Uh, the law was passed, deregulation, anyone could buy it. We could have had it, had all the routes for nothing. Just the, the, the uh, trouble of applying for them and getting a certificate so here we were uh, hugely in debt for something that we could have gotten for nothing. Pan Am could have gotten national at a far lower price had it not been for Frank Lorenzo, then a little-known chief of Texas International, along with Eastern Airlines, who started a bidding war with Pan Am, pushing the final sale price stupendously high. The purchase of National Airlines simply deteriorated the balance sheet of Pan Am, already suffering from the excessive buying binge of the new 747 jet fleet. Throughout 1970, Pan Am had been losing money heavily, and Pan Am's misfortunes created a sense of frustration among some of the airline's employees, who felt that the U.S. government could have helped the beleaguered airline. I think uh, for an airline that had sacrificed so much and donated so much to the government over the years, uh, Pan Am was really treated rather shabbily. I, I don't feel it's a government's responsibility to bail Pan Am out as much as, as we would have liked to have seen it, whether from an employee standpoint or if I were on the outside looking in. It's, it's, some, it's a logo that's uh, second only to the Coca-Cola logo, from what I understand, as far as recognition worldwide. And I feel sometimes some of the foreign countries even cared more for Pan Am than what we did here. And of course, there's the question of, well, why didn't the U.S. government bail us out? Well, how could they? They don't have any money. But they had bailed out Chrysler or Lockheed. They bailed out Chrysler and Lockheed, but we really cannot compare ourselves with Chrysler and Lockheed because the loss of Pan Am does not affect the national security of the country. Ironically, the airline once called the chosen instrument and our second line of defense played a heroic role when the security of the country was threatened during the Second World War. Pan American set up a naval training school at Dinner Key in 1940. During the next four years, the company trained over 5,000 navigators for the U.S. military. Although 22 U.S. airlines contributed to various capacities in the war effort, Pan American flew about half of the total air mileage flown by the air carriers. The airline flew over 90 million aeronautical miles on behalf of the U.S. government. Captain George Price, who as a Pan Am pilot ran secret missions deep in the Amazon during the Second World War, believes that it wasn't the recession, deregulation, rising fuel costs, or terrorism, all of which Pan Am had become accustomed to, that eroded the airline away. But rather, it was a combination of some unscrupulous people and unethical acts that took place in the highest office in the land that delivered the severe blows to Pan Am. A civil aeronautics board was established. The purpose of this board was to, uh, when a new route was available to be flown, it would have invite all carriers who were interested in flying this route to come and appear before the civil aeronautics board indulge in exhaustive hearings, they would present their, their uh, feelings why that airline should get it, and then the Civil Aeronautics Board would hand down its recommendation as to which of the airlines would, they would recommend get the route. There was a CAB case which was to award one American carrier the flight between New York City and Mexico City. For very obvious reasons, the CAB, after making hearing all of these airlines, 
they decided that it was a perfect fit for the Pan American flights inbound from Europe to continue with passengers who wanted to go to Latin America, Mexico in particular. And the CAB examiner handed down the award that the uh, the uh, the uh, recommendation that the award should go to Pan Am, but that had to go to the White House. It had to go to the Oval Office. Eddie Rickerbacker wanted that uh, uh, that route in the worst possible way. He wanted to get international, so he sent a very prominent Republican uh, uh, attorney by the name of Thomas E. Dewey to go and talk to the president in the Oval Office, and Thomas E. Dewey and his little satchel had $120,000. Eastern Airlines got the route. National Airlines. The, as, as airplanes came along that had longer range and could make longer nonstop flights, the, uh, the route between Miami and London opened up. Again, Pan Am was recommended by the CAB. National Airlines wanted that run in the worst way. It happened that the part of National Air, I won't name names here, but part of National Airlines management were good friends with, with the sitting president. And a $200,000 contribution was made to that president's uh, campaign for re-election. But he was re-elected, and another $200,000 went into the Oval Office. National Airlines got the route. National Airlines didn't have the equipment, they didn't have the airplanes to fly it, they didn't have the pilots to fly it, but they got the, the, the route. Most recently is the case in which uh, the route uh, to fly between Dallas-Fort Worth and Paris opened up. Pan American was recommended for that by the CAB, recommended that it be the, because it fit in with our Latin American routes, our Central American routes, and our European routes. Well, Delta Airlines got that route. It just happened that the President of the United States at that time and Delta Airlines both came from the same region, the state of Georgia. So anyway, I asked every time we had one meeting with the uh, President of Pan Am, I said, look, what's happening? We get recommended for all these routes and something changes in the White House, in the Oval Office. And this, the President came out and he said, we know we know where, we know when, and we know how much. And it's all in the Oval Office. Okay, that's one president. I asked the same question of another president later is on. There, is there a time frame? Was this in the post-war era? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. This, this was mm -hmm. uh, back in the 60s, probably. 60s or... Late 60s. Late 60s, yeah. I asked another president uh, the same question. He said... I can't tell you. He said, all I can tell you is that I spend 95% of my time trying to stop that erosion. But, he said, we're not going to pay any bribes. The sad truth about Pan Am's 64-year history is that it could almost be played in the arena of a tragic opera. By January 1991, it was apparent to Pan Am's management that the only way to keep the airline's logo flying was to file for bankruptcy under Chapter 11. Soon after, Delta emerged on the scene to buy Pan Am's routes and assets. When other airlines entered the picture, a bidding war ensued. Eventually, Delta made the highest bid, $416 million to buy Pan Am's routes. Further, it agreed to offer Pan Am an interim loan of $60 million and help the ailing carrier in its attempt to downsize itself and thus serve the Latin American market only. On July 27, 1991, Pan Am and Delta entered into an asset purchase and credit agreement. In addition to its obligations, Delta offered jobs to 6,000 former Pan Am employees. However, Pan Am continued to lose money and a succession of negotiations took place among Delta, Pan Am and the credit... After each such was asked and hand offer. On October 22, 1991, Delta made the final enhancement to its commitment. Delta agreed to provide a loan of up to $140 million, contingent upon Pan Am's financial condition. On November 1, 1991, Delta paid $416 million to Pan Am for its assets and hired 7,800 former Pan Am employees. 
1,200 more than it was obligated to by the contractual agreement. I think uh, Delta Airlines, uh, who hired almost 8,000 of our employees, uh, uh, tried very hard to make it work. And uh, so uh, one has to look back and say, well, in August, uh, when Delta Airlines made their move to acquire the shuttle and the European routes and, and, and give a life to Pan Am, which would have been go forth and it would have gone forth into the new Pan Am, uh, created a, uh, a continuation of a life that otherwise uh, would have ended uh, much earlier. We didn't select the management team. We didn't tell how we were supposed to operate. These were laid down on us by a, by a parent group who said, we are going to support you and you will succeed up until the December 4th, actually December 3rd. And they said, you're not going to succeed. We're getting out of this thing. Now they have their roots. They had what they came in to buy. But I will, do not believe that we were given the opportunity to succeed. Soon after, the creditors committee and Delta ended up in a dispute over financing the reorganization of Pan Am. Leon Marcus, the creditors committee lawyer, wrote a letter to Delta, casting doubts over its sincerity to go along with the reorganization plan. Somewhere on November 8th, there appeared a letter, letter from uh, the Leon Marcus, which I read, accusing Delta of of a number of, of practices that were misleading and apparently seeking the demise of, of Pan Am. And that might be a little harsh, but that's about the way it, uh, that I read it. The publicity from this dispute raised the question of Pan Am's viability to survive, and it adversely affected advance bookings and cash flow at Pan Am. On December 1st, 1991, Delta's chairman, Ron Allen, and four other senior officials met Pan Am's two top executives, Russell Ray and Rolf Anderson. At that meeting, Pan Am's executives informed Delta Airlines management that their reorganization plan was not feasible. The following day, Delta's attorney, Lawrence Handelsman, told Judge Cornelius Blackshear at the bankruptcy court that Delta was unwilling to put any more money at risk. The day after Pan Am's shutdown, Ron Allen of Delta sent a letter to concerned Congressman Porter J. Goss. In his letter, Allen stated, At a meeting on Sunday night, December the 1st, Messrs. Ray and Anderson confirmed to me that Pan Am's business plan, which formed the basis for Pan Am's reorganization, was not viable. In that meeting, we advised them that, in light of all the circumstances we had recently been made aware of, Delta could not justify providing new financing in advance of the confirmation of a plan of reorganization. We, we can put blame wherever, but the, the, uh, it, it appeared that at the very end we were led down a, a false path. And, and my feeling was at the, the very end, the new Pan American was never given the opportunity. We didn't uh, select the rules that we were going to play by. We didn't select the management team. We weren't uh, we were only told to go out and continue to do the best we could, and, we, and I believe that we did. But whenever an airline is on its, its shaky ground, you can, it's very obvious what the public are going to do. We've had too many examples. And I, I almost felt like we were told uh, to uh, get up into the batter circle and stand by. You're going to get up to bat here on December uh, 3rd. So. And, uh, and then just about at the time we were going to get up to bat, they said the game's over. Leon Marcus, counsel to the creditors committee charged, Delta created, revised, and reworked the business plan. They ran the company. They ran it into the ground. And now they're running away with the family jewels. We contacted Delta spokesperson, Mr. Clay McConnell, for an interview. Due to his scheduling problems, he was unable to give an interview on camera. However, on behalf of Delta Airlines, he sent us Delta's position statement dated December 10, 1991. The letter states, Delta is deeply troubled and frankly angered by statements made over the last week by the representatives of Pan Am's creditors committee as to Delta's role in the recent Pan Am shutdown. These statements that impugn Delta's good faith and that seek to hold Delta responsible for Pan Am's demise are false and irresponsible. On November 4, Mr. Marcus issued a letter 
in which he totally mischaracterized Delta's position on a number of issues, including Pan Am's labor contracts, and threatened to sue Delta. The Marcus letter and its distribution to the press had the immediate impact of roiling Pan Am's labor negotiations and injuring public confidence in Pan Am. When Delta responded with a demand that Mr. Marcus give us the committee's commitment to go through with the plan of reorganization on the terms already agreed to, Mr. Marcus refused to give us such a commitment. And I must say, uh, in many respects, uh, those of us who were not part of Pan Am at the time marveled uh, at how long Pan Am stood, stayed in business. I mean, I, I'm, I, I said goodbye to Pan Am from a viability standpoint many years ago. On January 8, 1992, Russell Ray Jr., after only two months as Pan Am's president, was removed from his post by Pan Am's creditors committee, who viewed him as Delta Airlines' representative. Russell Ray Jr. was replaced by Peter McHugh by the creditors committee to supervise the sale of Pan Am's assets. The creditors have now put Mr. Peter McHugh back in, who was their original choice, they said, and not Mr. Ray, who was imposed upon him by Delta. On January 30th, 1992, Pan Am sued Delta for $2.5 billion. Peter McHugh, Pan Am CEO, accused Delta of acting in bad faith by stating, having gotten the routes it wanted, Delta failed to follow through on the reorganization plan for Pan Am. Delta responded, the creditors committee lawsuit is totally without merit. Certain of its allegations are contradicted by the record of the bankruptcy court proceedings and by the terms of the very agreements that the committee approved. Delta will defend the litigation vigorously and believes that its position will be fully vindicated. On March 12, 1992, Pan Am employees sued Delta Airlines for $1.1 billion on behalf of 6,900 workers who lost their jobs as a result of Pan Am shutdown. Delta Airlines, facing multiple lawsuits and fighting charges that it killed Pan Am, filed a countersuit on April 6, 1992, alleging that Pan Am's management and the airline's creditors caused Pan Am's demise. A day after Pan Am shut down, the Miami Herald in its editorial noted, Pan Am never got a fair shot at future bookings. Nobody checks into a hotel that has a wrecking ball outside. Moreover, Delta's Atlanta-based management, in deciding that Pan Am is worth more dead and dismantled than alive and flying, undervalued Pan Am's franchise in Latin America. Granted, blaming Delta alone for Pan Am's demise would be unfair. Pan Am's earlier management left a trail of bad decisions. Even so, it was Delta that intervened at the pivotal moment when Pan Am still might have been saved. It was Delta that picked Pan Am's cherries for itself. It was Delta that, having promised to nurture the withered tree, chopped it down instead. There is a place where the sun comes up Bright with the promise of day Coming on high, making love with the sky It's only a daydream away Get up, get up Mark Pyle flew Pan Am's last scheduled flight from Barbados to Miami on December 4th, 1991. A month later, he paid a visit to Dinner Key. It was a nostalgic homage of sorts. The last pilot visiting the place for the first time where it all began. So this is the, I guess you could call it the sister ship of the one I flew my last uh, trip in, November 368, which uh, I'm told by maintenance is now in the desert been flown out and this one uh, I assume will be shortly when they said it's over this is something that we had prepared for for 
years at Pan Am. I mean, it had been, in my case, 11 years, <clears throat> and my family had wondered from month to month how long the airline would last. And even though emotionally or mentally prepared, I found myself emotionally unprepared, as I'm sure everybody else did. But we were overwhelmed with the, the sense of loss and the ladies on the flight, the flight attendants were overwhelmed with a sense of grief, almost immediately tearful. Everyone with their own thoughts, private thoughts. And uh, mine, of course, uh, were, ran the full gamut from, wow, it really happened, even though we knew it would, it finally did, and, and uh, where do you go, what do you do? and all the way to the sense of enormous loss and that a, an historical airline like Pan American was allowed to fall into the abyss. And then as we approached Miami, of course, we were told by ATC that we were the last. Actually, I guess it wasn't ATC, it was uh, the company, uh, radio frequency that we use. Pan Op, we called it, our operations people, said that we were the last ones. And at first I thought they must be joking. Uh, someone, one of my friends or something, had landed before I did just uh, making some kind of a joke out of the day. And then uh, the engineer assured me, and with tears in his eyes, that, that we were the last flight. And the tower said, can you do a low pass? Well, I haven't done that since the Navy. You know, so to me, this was fun, if nothing else. One last fun with an airplane. So having briefed the passengers so that they would know what to expect, uh, we flew down uh, runway 12 out here, run run runway 1-2 about 100 feet with flaps 15 and about 180 knots, nothing too spectacular. I would have liked to come in at 250 and smoke down the center of the runway, but uh, I didn't want any, any fear amongst the people any more than, than they would have to have. So we just did a very nice, easy, nonchalant, low pass and uh, over the field and pulled up and came back around for a landing. And I think that all of us in the cockpit were doing fairly well with our emotions until we saw the fire trucks lined up and the mercy vehicles and the Pan Am ground crew people and airport personnel and policemen and everybody else lined up to greet the airplane. And in my own case, <clears throat> I had no tears, although certainly emotionally shell-shocked, no tears until they fired the water cannon over the airplane and a final salute to everybody that had ever flown a Pan Am airplane, as far as I was concerned. At that moment, our crew was representative of everybody who had ever flown in this uniform and in these Clipper ships. And I don't mind telling you that at that moment, it was difficult to get to the gate, and everybody in the cockpit had smoke in their eyes, I guess, uh, macho term for what happened. And I said, uh, guys, just uh, don't let me ding the link tip to get this thing to the gate because I couldn't see very well from that point on. Quite emotional. And uh, probably will remain etched in my memory for a long time, I would think. After Mr. Tripp left, uh, no one seemed to share his uh, or understand his world viewpoint uh, of, the, of the need to develop a, a uh, communications and transport network throughout the world to express the American philosophy mm -hmm. and gain the friendship of, and the cooperation of all the countries. It seemed to end then. No one pursued that anymore. They just uh, operated airplanes as uh, everyone else did. The thing that goes back to me as, as uh, the strongest was the, the people of Pan Am. The people who were out there serving the coffee and selling the tickets and, and flying the airplane and twisting the wrenches and loading the bags. Uh, you could look the world over and you could never find a finer bunch of people to work with. I think I might possibly go into nursing, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure how happy I would be in that field. It's a lifestyle you can't, you can't beat it. After 22 years with Pan Am and five years with United, um, um, the airlines has really been a major part of my life. I'll always remember those times. I think I would best uh, describe Pan American as a elegant, majestic lady who, in the years of her glory, was very beautiful. And then towards the end of her existence, when she wasn't so beautiful anymore, she was put up 
at auction, as a, similar to a slave, would be put up to auction. And she was stripped of her clothing, one garment at a time. The Pacific, the shuttle, the Atlantic, all of the, the Pan Am building, the insurance companies, the hotels. One garment until she stood there essentially naked. But before they could sell the final piece and auction her off, she simply died of shame and embarrassment. An elegant lady now of history. And that thought has stuck with me that what a grand lady she was in her time. On March 22, 1992, the Associated Press reporting on the aftermath of Pan Am's demise noted, that means improved connections and direct flights from more cities in the United States to more cities in Europe. It also means better service for upscale passengers, an area where TWA and Pan Am could not keep up, as European carriers found ways to cater to high-paying, high-yield international travelers. The more financially secure American, Delta, and United can afford to do more. Innovations in high-class air travel now include gourmet meals and such amenities on some carriers as personal video screens. It's quite different from the last journeys of Pan Am, when flight attendants often ran out of juice and their tattered uniforms went years without replacement. On your right-hand side, you will see Pan Am's birthplace, the very first ticket office that opened here in Key West. Like the airline, the restaurant Pigeon House that occupied the building has also shut down. On the left is Harry Truman's winter... Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is the captain speaking. I'd like to welcome you aboard Clipper 235, nonstop now for Miami International Airport. The computer has us uh, planned today at 2 hours and 25 minutes. We'll be flying at uh, 29,000 feet, and the weather is projected to be good en route. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you very much for flying Pan American today. Our route of flight will take us um, southbound out of the Kennedy Airport along the coastline of New Jersey, over uh, Norfolk, Virginia, Wilmington, uh, North Carolina, and then down the uh, uh, coastline of Florida, and then into the Miami area. We're anticipating Miami on time. The weather in Miami is good. We have clear skies at the present time, some scattered showers over the Everglades as usual, and a temperature of 82 degrees. I invite you now to settle back, relax, enjoy your ride with us, and if there's anything any of us can do to make your trip more enjoyable, don't hesitate to call upon us. Thank you very much. After the demise of Pan Am, a foundation was formed called Pan Am Historical Foundation, previously known as Flight Spectrum. Pan Am Historical Foundation is a not-for-profit organization. Currently, it runs the Dinneke Marina, a small museum in Miami, Florida. In the near future, Miami City Hall will be vacated, and under the guidance of Pan Am Historical Foundation, it will be turned into a museum exhibiting artifacts from the former airline. The foundation needs funds to undertake such a mammoth task. Please send your donations in the form of a check or money order to Pan Am Historical Foundation, 557 Deer Run, Miami Springs, Florida, 33166.